Hey guys, I'm Ted and welcome back to our lecture series and for this lecture, our part three of our examination of the home front, we're going to dive right into things that we're going to discuss uh, Confederate opposition. And now in the Confederate states during the war, there was uh, a lot of there was a lot of things to oppose, uh, chiefly among them were the, the draft. There was a lot of opposition to the draft. Um, uh, a lot of people were very upset with the poor movement of goods domestically and the political infighting. Uh, another phenomenon was the presence of the Confederate civilian resistance movement. Uh, and then this, uh, this arose to, uh, as people began to hide goods from the government officials. Uh, this resistance was aided by some state governors. Now, the state governors... Um, uh, they they uh, opposed the the actions of the uh, the uh, central government by having men enroll and, and giving men good bounties to enroll in their state militias rather than have these men go off and fight in the Confederate army. That was the uh, that was the big thing. That was the big way to resist uh, the national draft. Now, as the United States armies push deeper and deeper into the Confederate heartland the, uh, of the Confederate states, uh, they created waves of Confederate refugees, mainly, in the, uh, mainly from the upper slave states at first. Uh, the refugees uh, clogged the roads, uh, they jumped trains if trains were available uh, in, an, uh, in an effort to make it to safer locations. Uh, they mostly went to cities like Richmond and Houston. East Texas in particular was a major draw for refugees, East Texas and Florida. Um, these were remote areas uh, where the refugees could be safe from uh, the deprivations of war, from the horrors of war, as they would have said. Now, the refugees were still in dire straits after they reached their destinations. They were often crammed into uh, inadequate housing units. Uh, they were rarely welcomed by the local populace. And, and in instances where they were welcomed, they quickly became objects of local scorn. In some areas, uh, they stressed the local population's ability to uh, provide for themselves and for the refugees. Um, when the war ended, most of the refugees returned home, but quite a few either drifted westward or just stayed in the, uh, the locations that they had, that they had uh, relocated to. The places that they uh, that they had left uh, their original homes for. Now, the Civil War brought a degradation that no other segment uh, or group of European Americans had ever seen or endured uh, before or since in American history and U.S. history. Uh, they 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 observed the wholesale destruction of private and community property. Um, Outside community policing, displacement of thousands, and uh, national animosity. Uh, these are common experiences for every other group uh, in the United States and world at large, but not to the European American population in the United States. Uh, they, they uniquely had this experience. Now, in the United States, there was very little dislocation. And it did not result in great upheaval. Um, no, nothing like what was experienced by in, in the Confederate States. The typical uh, dislocation experienced by the, uh, by the civilian population of the United States was that of fathers and brothers going to war. And those family, family members that were left behind um, simply waiting on letters to keep them updated on, the, uh, on what was happening with, with their loved one. Uh, to be updated on the war, uh, but but otherwise uh, the people left behind in uh, in the United States went on with their lives. Um, uh, their their life uh, fell into a very quick, fell very quickly into a very normal routine, um, and that was uh, the general experience in the United States. Life continuing with no major social upheaval. The war did not touch the United States the same way it does the Confederate States. Now, the Republican Party moved to consolidate its hold on the remaining states. Uh, they went on to become the dominant party in the 19th century. Uh, the economy did well with the uh, upswing uh, and big purchases for the war. With no armies marching through or continual battles taking place, um, the production, uh, they were able to keep up and really exceed 
in the production of foodstuffs and war materials. Um, the internal improvements aided with the speed and reliability of shipments sent to armies in the field. Uh, the two-party system endured. Uh, through a, though a clear minority, the Democratic Party continued to confront the Republicans and challenge them locally and nationally. The Republicans nonetheless set about enacting their legislative platform from the campaign of 1860. The Republicans, as noted in the previous lectures, uh, were divided into three camps, uh, three or three factions. There were the conservatives, the moderates, and the radicals. All of these factions voted together. All of these factions moved to frustrate uh, democratic ambitions. Um, they, uh, they, they, they formed that, that great barrier to the Democrats. Uh, the radicals, who made up the smaller percentage of the party, had I stated earlier, gained momentum as the war went on. Um, they were vehemently anti-slavery and passionately wanted to punish the rebels as severely as possible. Lincoln was a moderate, but even Lincoln edged closer to the radicals as the war went on. Now, the Democrats were split uh, into two camps during the Civil War. There were the war Democrats who favored war and supported prosecuting the war uh, to, a, to a reasonable conclusion. And then there were the Copperhead Democrats, or the anti-war Democrats. Uh, they wanted peace. They wanted a settlement with the Confederate States. And they opposed nearly everything the Republicans wanted to do. The Copperhead Democrats were strongest in the lower tier of free states and, of course, among the Irish. Um, in the 19th century, the Democratic Party you know, almost universally detested African Americans, abolitionists, teetotalers, they opposed the Emancipation Proclamation. They objected to adding, to adding, liberating the slaves to their war aims of the United States. Uh, they fought hard against the adoption of new protective tariffs and the creation of another national bank. Um, political momentum in the United States really ebbed and flowed uh, with the war between both parties gaining and losing support in succession until 1864. Now, the election of 1864 uh, took place uh, with this backdrop. The war was going poorly, and the Democratic Party had the chance to steal the presidency, a number of Senate seats, and a number of House seats. Things were so bleak that Lincoln took the necessary precaution of having a... of having uh, final meetings with his cabinet to go over transition. They went over transition briefings. Uh, before the election, the Democrats nominated George McClellan, who attracted a lot of support. He seemed like he was going to defeat Lincoln, but in between his nomination and the election, the United States military pulled off some of the most critical victories in United States history. Uh, these victories at Atlanta and Mobile Bay propelled Lincoln to re-election in 1864. The election of 1864 was also a was also a referendum on the war, the economic program, and most importantly, emancipation. Now, the Republican victory saw a major show of support for those, uh, it indicated a major show of support for those initiatives. Freedom and Union were now officially the war aims of the United States by consensus of the people. Uh, the election of 1864 also saw, for the first time, um, an election being held during a major war in United States history. None of the previous wars had taken place during um, uh, election years. Uh, a lot of wars have taken place because of elections, uh, but this was the first uh, election to take place during a war year. Now, the election of 1864 also saw the first time that soldiers were allowed to participate in the voting process. And the votes of the soldiers are very revealing. They, 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 they reveal a lot about what was happening in the United States. And they reveal a lot about these men. Um, and for, 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 this, uh, for this election, for, for their votes, uh, it really meant a lot for these, uh, it really meant a lot to these men. Voting for Lincoln meant the war would continue. And these men faced the very real prospect of being killed in battle or being killed by disease. Uh, voting for McClellan meant that the fighting would end. McClellan uh, was not going to push for the same type of end or resolution to the war that Lincoln was going to push for. The Democratic Party 
uh, their platform called for an immediate armistice. Um, McClellan, to uh, to his good credit, advocated winning the war first and not just offering an armistice to the Confederates. He wanted to preserve the Republic um, and then discuss what type of settlement would, uh, would be put into place. Um, the Confederate states, they were also watching the war unfold. Um, they, they were well aware, they were keenly aware of the, uh, the forces in action, the, the forces in motion in the United States. They, they fought for and they actually won. Uh, well, they didn't win, but they, but they, they fought for uh, and they were actually holding on for this election. They, 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 they had their hopes pinned on this election. They, they knew what a victory for the Democratic Party would mean for them and for their, uh, and, and for their particular war aims. They believed that if they held all until the election, they would succeed in their mission. Uh, Lincoln's re-election came as a complete shock and surprise for them. And for many, it cast a, a, a very dark pall uh, over, the, over the Confederate States. Okay, and we're going to break here with our examination uh, on, on part three. And we're going to come back to look at the United States uh, economy. Um, the, the thing to, to, to see exactly how the United States powered themselves to victory. Um, we'll break here and we'll come back with that. And as always, I'm Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you guys thought about this lecture. About, about this, uh, this lecture.